Welcome to We Build Great Apartment Communities, the only show dedicated to the process and strategies for transforming apartment buildings to thriving communities. I am your host, John Brackett, and welcome to the show. All right, folks, welcome to another great episode of We Build Great Apartment Communities, the only place where you come to learn how to take apartment buildings and turn them into amazing communities. I am your host, John Brackett. I have another great guest, and man, this is going to be an exciting one, one that is filled with some great information, and the reason why I'm really excited about this is because you hear folks being able to do this business remotely on a large scale, but rarely do you talk about or talk with them, rather, or get an opportunity to, to talk to them, right, even better. So today, we are going to break that myth and everyone now is going to have an opportunity to get invited into this conversation with Anthony Pinto. Welcome to the show, man. This is going to be a good one. Awesome. Thanks, John. I really appreciate you uh, you bringing me on here. I'm really excited to to talk about, uh, you know, my career in real estate and, and building communities and apartment complexes and all that. I'm really excited to talk to you. Sounds great, buddy. Happy to have you. Uh, even excited, rather, to have you because I know this is be, going to be a, not only a fun show, but a content-rich show. So I'm going to introduce you, invite our audience in. So Anthony Pinto, um, an active-duty Marine officer for six years. He controls, at this point, 316 units across Virginia, Georgia, uh, with about $20 million of assets under management. He also hosts the Lessons in Real Estate show podcast. He is a moderator of the Hampton Roads Multifamily and, and More Investor Group a United States Naval Academy bachelor's with a bachelor's degree of science and aerospace engineering. So first off, man, I want to thank you uh, for your service. I think, you know, sometimes it's hard to imagine the kind of liberties that we have in this country until you actually travel outside of it, right? And so I always make it a point, man, to, to thank those that not only have gone before me, but that are serving now because... You know, without you folks, man, um, the ideal, the United States is, is uh, it's an ideal, right? It's just, it's an ideal. It's an amazing ideal. But if that ideal is not protected, we just are literally unable to pursue the things that we have the ability to do today, right? So I want to thank you for that, man. Really appreciate you having you on. And I'm very excited to get into the show. Absolutely. No, it's, uh, it's, it's my honor to serve. And um you know, that's really poignant what you point out there about, uh, you know, the liberties and freedoms that we defend because I'm um, currently stationed in Japan and I've been here for the better part of a year now and I'll be here for another two years. And um, I've talked with other other naval officers who are in the Japanese. Um, they don't have a Navy. It's a self-defense force because they're technically not supposed to have a military anymore. Right. Um, and the whole mindset towards the military over here like that's not U.S. military is completely different. I mean, they, it's almost like they're office workers. Like they go in, they check in, you know, they punch in, they get, you know, their health care and they get a, a meager amount of money and they're just working long hours and then they just go home and that's it. Like there's no sort of, there's no sense of national identity uh, with being, a, you know, a military officer or being a military veteran um, for, you know, for the Japanese citizens over here. Um, which is, is just really interesting to me because I feel like in the United States, when I was back in the United States, like it's, I mean, it's, it's something to be proud of, to be, to be a veteran, to be, you know, a service sure. member. And, you know, I definitely felt that. And it's not, not my, my reason for joining, but it just really made the stark reality of how other countries treat the militaries and, and how they view the military as a whole and the individuals that serve there and how the United States does. And it's just, it's leaps and bounds above uh, some of the other countries of the world. And it's definitely made me appreciate, um, you know, the, the liberties and services I have within, you know, just within the United States Navy as a, as a whole. So appreciate you, you bringing that up. And like I said, it's, it's my honor to serve. Yeah, man, I really appreciate that. You know, I'll, I'll tell you a really quick story, right? So um, I even wrote an article on this. I'm going to find it. But the article is titled, um, We Were Flying Flags Before It Became a Political Statement. When I say we, meaning my flam family and I, right? This is a true story. <clears throat> so my daughter and I, my 14-year-old, right, she works out with me in the morning. We do a bunch of different stuff in our garage, right? We have all these this workout equipment. 
well, I can't say all this work at equipment for, but equipment that's designed for the environment that we're in today, right? Mm-hmm. Bare bones stuff, get it done stuff, right? <clears throat> so, you know, we're working out, man, sun's coming up. And normally she's up with me at six in the morning, right? So now it's a habit for her. So we're working out and um, I had someone come walk by and wasn't a neighbor, probably a guy just getting, getting some exercise in, right? And he made this comment. I'm not going to go into the comment, but the, the point was that he made a comment and it wasn't derogatory. It was like a passive aggressive comment, right? Like, man, you're flying a flag. That's great. And um, I remember thinking to myself, I was laughing right inside. I was laughing because, you know, my wife's father, retired military, right? This guy was in, this guy was in the army, the Navy. And um, that's the army, Navy, and then he finished off the last couple of years as a Air Force mechanic. Amazing with his hands, right? Damn. Um, also Vietnam vet. Okay. Incredible man. Incredible man. And her brother was a paratrooper, right? This is the only guy that I know, man. Jumped out of a plane. Shoot, didn't open, and he lived. Oof. Okay. Now, medical discharge, honorable discharge. Okay. But, you know, he's he's functional. And he, he's doing great. Okay, great guy. So I remember when this, these folks said this comment, right? It, it really made me think about the fact that, um, you know, this whole thing, it, we were flying flags, man, before it be, became a political statement, right? Because of our involvement with our families. But it also got me thinking about what is, what is the United States? What is it, right? Like, what does the flag represent? And so I literally started asking people, and here's the crazy thing. Everybody had a different answer, right? Everyone had a completely different answer. Is that bad? No, it's not. It, it's actually, I think, a reflection of who we are as a country, right? With the diversity that we have in this country, et cetera. But what it made me realize, and I've always thought this, but this time it made me just think about this a little bit differently, and it helped me understand how to articulate it the way that my family and I, uh, we approach it, right? And it's really, the U.S. for us, man, is an ideal. It's an ideal because you have all these cultures and people and it's this melting pot of people and ideas and cultures, right? So when you ask yourself, what is the United States? Well, for us, man, it's an ideal. It's an ideal to be able to pursue the opportunities that we have here based on the liberties Okay, and the freedoms that we've been afforded, which, thank God, man, you guys help create and maintain and expand, for that matter, in many cases, right, within this country. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, when you think about it, if this ideal is not maintained, it's an ideal, right? And if the ideal is not maintained and it goes away, so will our ability to pursue things that are greater than ourselves, right? It's really interesting. But... Mm-hmm. From that whole experience came this deeper understanding of, well, what is this really? If everybody has a different viewpoint of what this is. So anyways, man, I wanted to share that because quite honestly, it triggered the hell out of me that day. And, um, you know, I wrote this article. So um, for that, man, again, I just want to thank you. I think it's super cool. And that's one of the reasons why we're here today, able to have this conversation, right? So With that being said, as I always say, hey, if you want to honor those that are serving or that have gone before us, more importantly than thanking them, do something with the the liberties that you you have, right, that we are able to enjoy. So that's something that I always try to pass on to my kids. All right. So with that being said, let's get into this, man. Let's get into this. So share your story, Anthony Pinto, the syndication, man. So let's talk about this, man. Share your story, please, because this is going to be a great one. Right, because you're doing this from across the country in this case, actually across the world, right? And so you're able to make investments, expand your network, and you know deploy capital into investment opportunities. In this case, six of them in various states. When you're traveling and serving from different areas of the globe. So, man, share your story, your background, and let's get into this. This is going to be a good one. Uh, sure, sure. So um, I am, like you said, I'm a, I'm a submarine officer. So um, my 
I guess by nature, I'm a more of an engineering kind of mindset kind of guy, uh, systems and processes. It's always kind of how I've been. And, um, you know, when I graduated from the Naval Academy, I bounced all over the East Coast, going to different schools, and I finally landed in Norfolk in um, see, 2016. And that's when I first got into real estate. If you want to, if you want to call it that, I didn't really know what I was doing. Bought a house, thought I knew what I was doing, had no clue. Years later, so uh, I bought a house using my VA loan, uh, which is a zero percent down lo- um, down payment loan, and it's guaranteed by the uh, veteran Department of Veteran Affairs. And, um, you know, it's to really get service members and veterans a, a fresh start to be able to buy homes and get them some settled uh, without having, you know, to deal with PMI, a large down payment, things of that nature. So um, when I first got to Norfolk, bought a house, settled in it, um, knew I was eventually going to get married, probably going to rent it out. And um, so lived in that for a while, had a roommate, house hacked it, unintentionally house hacked it for a while, I was making pretty good money off of that. Uh, I was actually on a uh, submarine for about three years uh, during that time, and I was in shipyard, so I really didn't really have a lot of time to do anything. Didn't know about real, really real estate investing as a whole, uh, how to manage money well, anything like that. And my whole life has revolved around this submarine. And you know, uh, at the end of my time on that submarine, this is uh, summer of 2018, we went on our sea trials, which is – Um, you know, a week long period where we go and we test the submarine and literally everything, every possible system, every angle, every depth, um, which was interesting, but it's also kind of nerve wracking taking a submarine out that hasn't seen, you know, uh, deep water. And gosh, at that point it had been five years and had holes cut in it, had been chopped apart, put back together like a Frankenstein boat. So needless to say, it was nerve-wracking. Um, but during that time, it really got me thinking about, well, do I want to spend the next, gosh, at that point, it was, I was three years in. So the next 17 years of my life, you know, staying in the Navy and trying to pursue retirement, or do I want to get out and work on something else? So I just started exploring other options, got, I looked into uh, real estate investing as an option, and stumbled upon a guy who is also a military investor. Um, his name's Stu Grazier. He's based out of Colorado. And he put me onto a couple books. Um, one of them was Quintessential Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And the other one was Set for Life by Scott Trench, and uh, who's now the CEO of Bigger Pockets. And uh, in that book, he talks a lot about um, cutting the fat from your life and how to save up uh, capital if you think that you don't have money now to invest in real estate. And one of the other things he talked about was house hacking. And so, you know, I was like, oh, okay, I have this house. I kind of understand what it's like to rent to someone else, what it's like to be a homeowner. And I just wanted to take that to the next level. So I was like, okay, like how, how do I do that specifically? Because I can't just house hack my way from house to house for the rest of my career and do that with some rapidity, if you will. So I decided to buy a small multifamily. And in this case, I bought a quad. And so um, got off of my sea tour on literally the day before Thanksgiving in 2018. Uh, two weeks later was in my first real estate investing meetup. Uh, met my realtor. A week later had a quad under contract, which uh, looking at <laughs> the offer price I put in then was, was pretty dumb. And I really got lucky with, uh, with what I ended up getting it for because uh, last minute um, the price dropped about 25000 due to the appraisal and due to just the circumstances <laughs> of the case. So I was really I like lucky. like you said that because, last minute it dropped. <laughs> well, it was literally the day after we were supposed to originally close, the VA appraiser came back and was like, hey, this is not worth it at all what you think it is. And one of the things with, the, with using a VA loan is they will only go up to what the VA appraiser says. So uh, we originally had agreed at on two ten or sorry three ten for the purchase price of the property three hundred ten thousand, and the appraisal came back at two eighty seven, and I was like, oh my gosh, like what am I going to do? How am I going to fill you know almost a twenty three twenty five thousand dollar gap? Right. And so we came back together, and uh, the owner's like, hey, you know, we'll drop it down to you know two hundred eighty seven thousand if you pay all the closing costs, which um, it seemed to be a really great deal, uh, you know, up front. You know, say only pay seven thousand dollars to get a twenty five thousand dollar discount, essentially. So, but that meant that we had to pretty much go through our whole savings uh, to uh, to cover closing costs. So sure. that was not a great way to start a real estate career. Um, 
especially trying to get my wife on board with, uh, with this whole plan. <laughs> so um, I like how you said that, man, and then you took a sip of your coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Just let that sink in a little bit there. Yeah, yeah I'm sure it had to. <laughs> yeah. Well, I would just awesome. I would just say, you know, throughout my career, the biggest thing that has really impacted my ability to um, continuously buy real estate and continuously, you know, pursue this career and this passion for me has been the involvement of my wife and been the involvement of my family. Because, you know, as I like to remind her, because um, she doesn't, she doesn't particularly enjoy the the, the um, specifics of real estate, the numbers, the, all of that. She enjoys the benefits of it, and she enjoys, you know, what it means idealistically to us as a as our future kind of nest egg, if you will. Right. Um, yeah. But you know, going through blowing through her savings and pretty much going from zero to sixty in three weeks, uh, she was not particularly happy about that. And also having to move to a completely different neighborhood and live in a quad and and downsize. Pretty dramatically, we went from a, a you know a two thousand square foot four bedroom house to an eleven hundred square foot studio apartment uh, in a completely different part of town. And so I would just I'll just praise my wife for being open minded about uh, about all of that and, and really taking it on board because I mean it it could have been a disaster and luckily like we really we had the funds uh, like personal have the funds to be able to support a lot of the issues that we had with the property. But anyways, so, uh, timeline wise, uh, I, I like that. Man. I really like what you said about, uh, your wife and your family being a big driver. So mm-hmm. let me just add just really, really quick story. Okay. Sure. Eh, I'm not going to tell the story. Let me condense it. I'm just going to make a comment. Sure. So, um, I, I agree with you. So my wife and I've been married for 23 years, man, and she's a huge part of essentially everything that I do. <clears throat> and I involve her in everything for a lot of different reasons. I just want to make sure she is fully aware of what's going on, why, in case I step in front of a truck, man, or a bus, and, you know, I go away, right? <clears throat> and I also have three daughters. So for me, that's really important. Um, you know, my dad passed away when I was 21, and my my mom, eighth grade education, she just really struggled, and I never forgot that. <clears throat> so I wanted to make sure that, you know, I put my wife in a place where she literally didn't need me, right? She had She has so many skills that she – doesn't need me. <laughs> and it was, it, it's actually very contrary to how most men would think, right? Because, um, that's just not how kind of, that's not a common thing. Right. But because I ha- I watched my mom go through that, man. Um, I just really understood the challenges that, that were created by her not having the skills to be able to carry on on her own. And she, she, fortunately, man, she's, um, an, an amazing woman, Okay. And we always say that my mom has a master's degree in life and my dad was kind of the academic and it was really true. Um, but needless to say, there was just a deficit there and I never forgot that. So I wanted to, well, my biggest thing was, man, to make sure that, you know, my wife was in a place where she just, if I passed, it wouldn't matter. Right. So um, I think it's really awesome, man, that, and honorable that you say that. And it's going to pay big dividends long term. The other thing I would say is that, and, and I really believe this, I, I think that you being, the better you are at your marriage, uh, it helps you become a better business person, right? And vice versa. If you really were able to carry over the lessons that you learn in business to your marriage, right? And make you a better husband, make you a better father. But I think it's really the reverse. The better you are at being a husband and a father, the better you are at being a business person. So anyways, with that being said, man, I appreciate you sharing that. Go ahead. Sure, sure. No, no, I completely agree. I mean, it's, I, I think that some people to think that they can just kind of push through and keep business and family on two separate hands. And it's just, it's, in my opinion, it's not really possible. And I've seen it over and over again, where people try to just cut that cord when they leave the office and just don't talk about business at home at all. And then they come to work and they don't talk about family at all. And it's just, if business is big enough for you, if it's a passionate for you, then it should be something that your family should be a part of. I mean, it's, if something bad at work happens, it's probably like going to follow you home. If something bad at work at home happens, it's probably going to follow you to work. And I think that those two are just so intertwined that you just can't get away from it. 
And so why wouldn't you want to have a, a harmony in both sides of, you know, passions within your life? Um, but that's just my opinion. So I like it, it worked out for I like me. It. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I really like it. Okay, cool. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to pivot a little bit, and I appreciate the background. Love it. It's going to add some context to where we're going next. Sure. So let's talk a little bit about the six multifamily properties that you've been able to acquire while you have been traveling the world, right? On sure. duty, full-time career, and also an investor. For most people, that's going to sound almost um, impossible, right? Because it's really a mindset shift, right? Being being able to operate remotely, man, is a mindset shift. And, of course, process and systems and you being comfortable with with um, taking action around something that you have some understanding about, right? But let's talk about your story doing that and how you were able to make that first leap, okay, funding a pretty good-sized deal, syndication, um, while you were traveling the world. So walk us through that. Uh, what was the first fear? And then how did you overcome that to start taking action, right, to then moving this thing forward to a reality? Sure. Um, so I guess I'll preface all that by saying um, in, in 2019, I knew that I was coming to Japan at the end of 2019. So, um, you know, March and April of that time, I knew that I only had – but not eight, nine months left in country before I was going to move out here. And so I really needed to make moves on something or at least make sure that I had a knowledge base down and in, in larger multifamily so that I could continue working on acquiring properties and all that while I was here. And um, I found a property when I was still at home, still in Virginia uh, area that was in Kansas City. And it was my... Um, my patient zero, if you will, for my first, uh, for you, you into, wait, what did you call it? Your what? My patient zero. You You got to elaborate on that, man. Yeah, it was, uh, it was about as bad of a, as a property as you can get. And it was definitely my first test subject. And, um, (laughs) it, it taught me a lot of lessons learned on this experiment that we call, you know, multifamily real estate business as a whole. And, um, the reason why is because I completely tried to do it on my own. Um, didn't have the net worth, didn't have the liquidity, didn't have any capital raise, didn't have any experience, wasn't even local to the area. Hadn't even seen the property when I put an offer in, but I just, I was very adamant about trying to get a property, you know, under my belt so that I could start building up this experience, start building up this track record and then start building up, I mean, and just end the, get the ball rolling. And so had this property, 34 unit under contract. Uh, I'd been on the market for a while. That should have been my first red flag. Uh, I was also on LoopNet. Should have been my second red flag. Um, <laughs> talk, talked with you know other operators about it and just didn't get the warm and fuzzy from even local operators on it. But it was like, oh, you know, I see the potential in this and the numbers. Like I can really see it kind of taking off. Um, and so started going through all the motions for it, started to try to raise capital, and uh, finally just went to the property. And this was like three days before due diligence uh, was supposed to end. And actually walked the property for the first time. I was like, oh, my gosh, wow. Like, I – this property is <laughs> not at all – Oh, that's good, man. That's good. I thought it was. Um, you know, the buildings were 80 years old, hadn't really been renovated at all during that time. <laughs> um, you know, just 80 years walk, old. That's good. Yeah. Walk in the halls. I mean, there was air conditioning systems that were almost that old, like 50, 60 years old, still operating. That's not um, an air conditioning were, system, man. That's a that's an anchor. Was there a lake? Yeah, nearby? right. It, yeah, right. I was like, <laughs> oh my gosh, how is this thing still operating? Like, is it, is it <laughs> just wind power just moving through this thing to get it that's going? That's good. Um, you know, there were electrical outlets, like literally, or breakers right next to showers in some of the units. Oh, it was just, it was a mess. It was a mess of a property. And I just like, you know, this is so large of a property for me to take on right now, especially by myself not having anybody local to do it, not having any capital, you know, not having really any of the, any of the uh, tools I needed to actually take down this property. And so um, I ended up pulling the contract on it just based off of how really the physical report that came in from the inspectors, it was just, it's going to cost way more. It's going to cost more than the price of the property to be able to turn this property around to just be habitable in the first place. So needless to say, turned around, um, got my, uh, uh, Got the EMD back, which is good because I had an investor put that up. So I only lost five grand of my own money, including traveling costs. 
Uh, but it was uh, it was an expensive lesson, but it was a good lesson, and I could have lost a lot more on it. So right. it just really made me think that you know if I can't do this while being in the states, um, you know, from being local and not really and trying to do everything on my own is really what it came to is I I couldn't do everything on my own, um, particularly from the lending side of things. I didn't have a track record, didn't have net worth, liquidity, all those things, and so. I was like, hey, I need partners to do this. So started networking a lot more, started going to a lot more conferences, uh, networking with local people. And, um, you know, it's getting towards the end of my time in, two, in uh, 2019 being in the States. And I started uh, doing interviews for my podcast, The Lessons in Real Estate Show. And, you know, one of the things I th- was thinking about that I could do while I was here in Japan you know, not so much as touring properties, doing due diligence, asset managing, but what I could do is I could try to raise capital and I could try to put out content as much as possible and share my experience, um, share my experience specifically as a military investor, investing from abroad, investing as a submarine officer, you know, filling all, all kind of uh, different wickets that you would typically see from, uh, from different operators. So I just wanted to share that experience because I think that real estate is such a great opportunity for a lot of military investors that they just don't necessarily know about because they don't see a lot of people doing it as active duty, uh, much less. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Yeah. So, um, so started doing interviews for the podcast in November, December last year. And one of the guys I interviewed was, who is now my partner. Um, once we got done with the interview, it's like, Hey, I got this deal, um, you know, that I'm, uh, that I'm, uh, have under contract 104 units, you know, it's a $10 million deal or raising capital for it. Are you, you know, are you interested in coming in? I was like, well, I've never raised like real capital before. At that point, you know, I done a JV deal for fifty grand, but you know, we're talking a two point eight million dollar raise here. It's different, different size potatoes here we're dealing with. So I was like, hey, you know, sure, I'll, I'll come in on it. What's the worst that happens? I I learned something, and you know, I raised a little bit of capital, get a track record under my belt. So he brought me in on that deal. It's about ten minutes away uh, from where I lived. Great property. And close on that one in March and end up raising about 800000 uh personally for that deal, which like blew my mind because I didn't think I was going to be able to raise that much. Um, and that just opened the floodgates to, to a whole bunch of other deals. So 104 units in March, 112 units in uh, September. That was in Savannah. Raised another 800000 for that one personally. And then we just closed on a 92 unit in the Hampton Roads area uh, on Halloween, actually of this year. And that was a $500,000 raise. So over those properties, um, we ended up raising just under 10 million to uh, cover closing costs and all of that. And I personally raised about 2.3 of that uh, within one, within one year of starting my capital raising campaign while active duty. And I did all of that while being here in Japan. Um, needless to say, it's, the 2020 has been a good year, a good year for me, um, from I like it. pretty much zero to 60 in really one year. So it's, uh, it's, it's been a great year and I can get into more details on how that's, how that's all kind of broken down for me. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. So why don't we talk about, why don't we talk about what made you so effective at raising capital and how you did that, right? Because it sounds like that's really where you're spending your time and energy. So that's where you've built some mastery in. And it sounds like that's where you're going to be spending your time moving forward. So um, let's see, why don't we start with, you know, you talking about maybe uh, what it, what is your process for going about raising capital, right? And then of course, uh, getting soft commitments and then turning them into hard commitments. Sure. So one of the things that I um, really noticed is when raising capital um, is that, you have to give before you can get. And adding value, I think, is a tremendous way to not only get your name out there, but to also um, make people feel like they understand you enough to be able to trust you, to invest with you. And so one of the things I did, without really even thinking about where it could lead in terms of um, you know, dollars to uh, hour uh, when it comes to you know, how much time I was actually putting in, was just putting out a ton of content and documenting my journey. Um, gosh, I probably put out at this point thousands of hours of, of content, just me talking about the experience, me teaching about something, me talking about 
uh, a property that we just acquired or how the process is going. And that is really what's been the uh, foundation for uh, my capital raising abilities, if you will. It's just trying to add value through telling my story. And it has really been useful for me because the vast majority of the people who have invested with me have been military investors who have been just like me, who have, you know, maybe, you know, twenty five, fifty thousand dollars that they have saved up uh, through a bonus or through just, you know, prudent financial investments and just don't know what to do with it. You know, they see the aspects of real estate investing and particularly multifamily and, you know, the tax savings, excuse me, um, the long-term benefits of that, the stability compared to capital markets. And, um, you know, they just don't know really what to do with it. And so I think educating people has been the number one way that I have um, not only interacted and met investors, but also have brought on investors to uh, to be a part of our, our project. And so I think that's the number one thing is just providing value. And um, it I've done it through Facebook Live videos. I've done it through YouTube videos, uh, LinkedIn videos. Um, now it's mainly kind of condensed all into the podcast itself. So uh, the podcast I do, uh, do three episodes a week. Uh, or on Mondays, we do PCI Teaches. So I, I talk about a particular topic in regards to syndications or multifamily as a whole. Um, on Wednesdays, I do a seg- uh, segment called L and T or Learn and Teach, where I just talk about something I learned that week, and it's kind of it could be really anything random. Uh, like this past week, I talked about like taking care of your body and why it's important to take care of our bodies. I was sick for the past week, and then um, and then on Thursdays, I actually have a podcast guest on, and they talk about you know multifamily um, from a military investor standpoint. <laughs> And so that's really been the basis for, uh, for my capital raising ability. And, you know, a lot of people talk about digging the well before you need it. And I think that is crucial is you, you need to start putting out those feelers now. You need to start tell, letting people know now, yes, I want to invest in real estate or, or I am investing in real estate. I am raising capital. These are the deals we're going to have. Having sample deals available, having your credentials, your track record, your experience, the partners you're bringing on. Um, how the other deals are going for you, so on and so forth. I think having all of that up front um, and being able to provide to investors is uh, is huge. And so I would say the second thing is that um, when we started getting into a lot of these syndications, like I said, a lot of them were military investors. And due to um, some stringent SEC regulations, there's not a lot of options for uh military investors to get in because a lot of military investors are non-accredited investors, which means that they don't meet the uh, strict wickets for, uh, you know, a million dollar net worth without primary residence, $200,000 net, um, you know, income, not married, so on and so forth. The, the average military investor just does not make that much money. And even the guys who are making that much money, like, um, making that much money or not necessarily making it on paper because of all the bonuses and all the housing allowances and stuff like that we get just doesn't count as taxable income. So it makes it very hard for those types of investors to get on these deals. So my partner and I, he's also a, uh, a Navy veteran started doing a lot more five or six B offering so that we could bring in those military investors. But that still again, limits you only to 35 non-accredited investors. And I was like, you know, I feel like we're doing our brothers and sisters a disservice by only doing these types of smaller deals. And, you know, once you're getting into, you know, 10, 20, $50 million raise, it's hard to do a 506B offering um, because you can't advertise, you can't put it out to other people um, like you could with a 506C offering. And so we just saw this over and over again with these deals we were doing, you know, with 104 unit, we did a 506 B, the 112 unit, 506 B, and then finally it's 92 unit, 506 B. And we just had more and more non-accredited investors coming in who are military investors. And it just kind of dawned on us that, you know, there's got to be a better way to, uh, to raise this capital. And, you know, I, I'm fine for, for people going after, not, uh, going after accredited investors. There's a lot of money that way. Now you can just do 506C offerings, go public all, all day long until the cows come home and raise your capital that way. But, you know, for me, real estate, uh, gave me an opportunity to, it gave me an option other than the military. And th- for some people, they're fine with just, you know, sticking in their 20 years and having their nesting. But for other people, they're, they want to have an option to 
to pursue a life that doesn't necessarily have to be tied to the military. And I think a lot of people kind of get, I don't want to say trapped, but feel obligated to have to do their 20 years because they don't know what else there is as an option. They don't know what's on the other side. They don't know if the grass is necessarily greener. And if you look at homeless vet statistics in this country, it's not going down at all. And a lot of the homeless vets you see now are pretty recent vets, like since, you know, in the past 10, five, 10 years. And that's disheartening to me. And it just proves to me that a lot of people are getting out and not necessarily knowing what they're doing. So to, to get off my high horse there, uh, we want to have another option for military investors to uh, be able to get into, to, um, you know, not necessarily syndications, but to get into commercial real estate. So my partner and I formed this company called Mission First Capital, and it is a Regulation A plus fund. And it's different in the syndication in that we can have an unlimited amount of non-accredited investors, um, so essentially an unlimited amount of military veterans or active duty uh, military investors on, and uh, we can offer much lower minimums than they typically see in syndications. And you know, they, there's not really a lot that that needs to go into evaluating uh, the property itself uh, because it's a blind pool. So essentially, uh, individuals pay into this pool and they get a set amount of preferred return uh, for their capital. Versus a syndication where you find the deal and then you find the capital. We're finding the capital and then finding the deal. And the fund is specifically for military and active duty uh, veterans. So those who are, um, you know, have their bonuses, those who have a, a set amount of income coming in and want to do something better with that, want to make their money work for them. And that's why we built out uh, this fund uh, for um, two Navy guys, two uh, Navy veterans to run this fund. One is active duty, one as uh, boots on the ground and really the CEO of this whole operation to uh, give military and active duty guys another option to invest in real estate uh, without having to have, you know, fifty, a hundred thousand uh, dollars investment to drop, um, you know, without having to be local to the area, without having to, uh, you know, spend months and months of research uh, trying to figure out how to actively invest in real estate. Um, it just, it gives an option for military guys that doesn't otherwise exist right now. And that's really what we're excited about with this project. Awesome, man. I think that's really smart. So here are a couple of questions. Okay. So one, one of the challenges when you're, when you're um, putting together a fund like that with really small investment dollars is accounting. Mm -hmm. Right, accounting and then creating the transparency around giving people access so that they understand, you know, what their basis is in the investment, right? And they can track uh, not only the investment, but they can get access to K1s, right? Documentation, uh, really, really critical and crucial. Um, counting, the accounting piece of that is going to be a big one. So are you guys there yet where you've, where you've thought through that? And if so, can you share a little bit about that? Sure. I mean, I can just kind of walk through the whole process if you want for how, kind of what it took to to get that set up, if that's, that's what you want. Yeah, you can do that too. But I, I think one of the big things is just the accounting, how you were able to put that together. And I know there, there are firms out there that specialize in doing accounting for funds, right? <clears throat> there are a couple of them out there that I'm familiar with. But yeah, walk us through, man, and then talk to us about, I know you're not there yet, right, where you're making distributions and you have to really worry about that, but I'm sure you've thought through that at least, and you're probably considering, you know, a couple of firms that do that. But yeah, walk, let's, that, that'd be great if you can walk us through that. Yeah. So, um, you know, what's kind of unique about this is uh, it, it's it's not something that you typically see out on the market uh, from syndicators in the past. Um, you know, outside of like Grant Cardone, you don't really hear of a lot of, of Regulation A uh, type of real estate opportunities like this. Um Mainly because a lot of them are, are capped, and it's quite expensive to uh, to start off a uh, Reggae Plus fund. I mean, at Indeed. this point, you know, we probably put in about a hundred hundred thousand of our own personal capital into this, and um, you know, there's a lot of moving parts that go into it, uh, more so than a typical syndication would see. You know, you raise money for a syndication, you spend you know ten fifteen thousand dollars for an SEC attorney to draft up your PPM and all the documents for that. You file it. And then you really don't have to worry anything about SEC unless something happens again. And you're really just kind of running the property and people are getting their investments. Well, with the Reg A Plus Fund, there's a lot more oversight and, and auditing that goes into it. So we actually have to have semi-annual audits that go on. And we have 
we have uh, two separate accounting slash auditing companies. So we got one hand that is the auditors specifically. So, you know, once or twice a year, they come in and they look at the books and they're like, yes, this is good. No, this is not good. Yes, we need to put this into um, a better format or whatever. And then we got the accounting side who deals with the typical bookkeeping of the property. So they need to keep themselves uh, uh, separate from uh, from each other. And so we have two specific companies that do that. And in the accounting side, we have a, a company who specifically deals in real estate reg A plus funds, and they've been doing it for the past 20, 25 years. And so they're quite versed in everything that needs to go on in terms of what the SEC is going to want to see in terms of the accounting, uh, how the distributions are going to go out, the K-1s go out. Um, you know, the types of reports that they need to be produced for the auditors and so on and so forth. And then the third leg of that is that we have a investor portal that we're using through Groundbreaker, um, which is, you know, similar to Appfolio, Syndication Pro, all those other ones um, that gives the investor the ability to log in, see, you know, yes, uh, for example, you invested, you know, $10,000, see what that $10,000 is, is doing for you, see the distributions you receive. Uh, see the return on capital you received, see when that investment is actually going to mature, so on and so forth. You can see all the details of your investment specifically within the investor portal, uh, which is uh, which is a great option for us. So, um, yeah, no, that's definitely a, a concern that we've had, and it's uh, an issue that we've rectified by kind of combining and, and, and syncing the two uh, larger arms there, which is the accounting and the groundbreaker side of things, so that – you know, when an investment is made through Groundbreaker, it gets tracked by the accounting. And then when uh, the accountant needs to produce the necessary documents in terms of the tax documents for the investor, that gets shot back over to Groundbreaker and everything is available in one precise portal for the investor to be able to track their investment. Why why Groundbreaker versus some of the other options that are out there? Uh, Groundbreaker was in the beginning stages of – well, I want to say beginning stages. They are in – Beta Plus, let's just say that uh, phase of, of producing their product. So um, the website itself is is uh, and the portal itself is still malleable enough that we could uh, form it to what we wanted it to be. Um, you know, a lot of syndication portals right now will be a portal you log into. You can see your specific property. Um, or if you have multiple properties that the investors invested in, you can go to each individual property and see how that all uh, kind of lays out. Uh, with Groundbreaker, the way we have the fund set up, it's they're not looking at specific properties. They're looking at uh, specific fund options. Uh, so we have a couple fund options, one that's more um, ca- monthly cash flow based and one that's more of a retirement growth fund type of basis. And so they can see their investment in each of those uh, options there. Um, but Groundbreaker gave us the opportunity to build out the platform how we wanted it to be built out and the different kind of nuanced uh, things that needed to be changed uh, differently than what a typical syndication investor portal would look like because we're doing it in a fund option rather than a syndication option. So that's why we ended up going with Groundbreaker. And the staff is really responsive. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm on a, a – first name basis with the CEO. We talk quite a bit. Um, you know, the support is, is amazing over there. Really responsive to changes or issues that we've had. Uh, the engineering guys have been really responsive to, Hey, you know, we need to change or tweak this particular thing. How long would it take? Okay. You know, it'll take a couple months or whatever. Um, but they're, they're responsive to changes that need to be done or like little things here and there. Um, that we want to add change so we can streamline the process as much as possible. And that just wasn't um, wasn't necessarily an option with an established, well-established investor portal like Appfolio or Syndication Pro, where they are very much singularly minded and focused on a specific pathway um, that has worked for them. And it's just, it's it's not necessarily as malleable as we would have liked. Sure, sure. And I can, I can, I can see that. And that's great feedback. So what is the biggest challenge so far that you've had to overcome to keep moving this ball forward? Because it's a process, Uh, right? For this. Yeah. I mean, we've spent, this is the better part of a year that we've been working on this. And um, honestly, it's knowing how to get everything set up. You know, there are hundreds of operators out there who are doing multifamily investing and doing specifically doing syndications and lots of a ton of books out there, a ton of different programs. You can drop a ton of money and mentorship programs that tell you exactly A to Z how to, you know, raise capital, how to build out your, your brand, raise capital, 
uh, evaluate properties and get to the closing point um, from the syndication standpoint. There's not a lot out there that tell you how to build out a Reg A plus fund, all the things you need to do for it, all the auditing that needs to go into it, um, you know, the accounting that needs to go into it. And so uh, a lot of what we're doing um, outside of having to pay a company to specifically do all that for us has been piecing together how we build that out because there's not there aren't any programs out there that tell you how to do that um, like there are with syndication. So that's been the biggest challenge is trying to figure out, okay, I need to know this, like, like I need to know all the regulations for this. I need to know how much capital we can raise. I need to know the regulations in terms of SEC. I need to know all the documents that we need, um, the auditing that needs to go into it, the accounting that needs to go into it, um, like the back of my hand. And that's been the biggest thing for me is trying to figure all of that out and get it into motion um, so that we can get us to the end point, which, well, which is really the beginning point, which is starting to raise capital. And there's been sure. a lot of, of backroom building out and a lot of systems and processes building out um, to get us to that point. And that's probably been the biggest challenge is thinking like, okay, you know, doing a syndication is one thing, trying to build out a brand new company that is uh, a SEC regulated company is something completely different. Um, so I think that's been the, been the biggest challenge and just trying to figure that out how to get it into motion. And I would say the second thing is trying to get the SEC 1A filing, which is also called an offering circular, um, together and ready to go. And it's a uh, much bigger document than even the PPM because there's a lot more that goes into it. You know, we're talking hundreds of pages of this document that need to get drafted together. And it just takes time. And when you have edits to it, it takes time to do the edits and back and forth and so I would just say if uh, anyone is, is interested in trying to do that in the future, one, you need the money for it. You definitely need the money for it. Um, and don't be afraid, one, to pull that money yourself, like put it in personally, or two, raise that through angel investors, however you want to break that down. And two, it's going to take time. It's going to take a lot more time than you think it's going to take. <laughs> it always um, does, man. Yeah, we uh, we had this kind of time frame set out like, hey, you know, January 1st is when we're going to have – uh, you know, the fund open to start raising capital. Well, this thing happened and then this thing happened and the timeline gets compressed. And then now here we are, um, you know, so I would just, just understand that your, your timeline's probably going to compress. Um, you're probably going to end up spending more money than you originally uh, bet. And the process is, it's going to be difficult. You know, you're, you're going down um, paths that are normally trodden by, multi-billion dollar organizations, multi-billion dollar individuals. And they're probably not going to tell you how to, uh, how to steal their, I would say steal, how to um, build out their business process that, is, that has made them those billions of dollars. So just be ready for that. I'm just saying. Interesting. I, I really appreciate you sharing that. So where do you think you'll end um, this business, starting this business with capital, right? How much do you think you'll spend before you actually get through the uh, the A plus round? So we're looking. So the limit for the for a reggae plus fund right now um, is fifty million, and uh, we're looking to raise twenty million within this first year. So we have to we have a year, up to a year to raise that amount of money. Um, you know, and if we get fifteen million, if we get twenty five million, then we can just keep going. Uh, so that's one of the benefits with a reggae plus fund like this is um, one we can start raising capital from day one. Two, we can we can start using that capital from day one as well. So, you know, if we raise $10 million within the first month, um, we can start deploying that $10 million within the first month as needed and then, you know, wait another 11 months to raise the other $10 million. Um, and then we can also close it at any point too as well. You know, so if we get $20 million within the first five months, which is say, um, you know, and – uh, you know, we, we want to go to 50 million. We can decide to leave it open or we can decide to close it at that point and then just re kind of recycle everything over again. So that's one of the, uh, I would say cruxes about doing a reggae plus fund is that, you know, you have to restart the process every single time, you know, just like a, a, a 506B, a 506C offering. Every time you have a new property, you got to open a new, uh, you know, uh, PPM and, and get the whole process going again. Same thing as a Reg A plus fund. So we'd have to go through the whole process again with a new fund next year and then so on and so on and so on. Um, but the thing is, is when you're dealing with, you know, 10, 20, $50 million deals, um, the, the price to get those going, especially when you've got one already set up, 
is significantly reduced and it's significantly diluted when you're talking a hundred thousand uh, dollars versus one million dollars that you're trying to raise versus a hundred thousand dollars and fifty million dollars that you're trying to raise so we'll just uh, I'll just keep that in mind that uh, you know there's a lot of options and it just you really need to know what you're doing uh, and and all the uh, background data um, and SEC regulations that go into it. Nice man, that, that's really really good feedback. So where do you think you'll you'll, you'll end up around 150 thousand spent before you know you get this thing approved and through? Or um, probably that's probably when we'll end up shaking out. Um, you know, but that's that's money well worth spending when you know we're talking. This is the launch of a multi billion dollar. Uh, real estate empire. So, um, how long? The bucket how now, long you know? So once you get this first one established, how easy is it go back and to launch another fund? How 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 quickly is that timeline collapse? Right? How much more can you collapse that time from right now? For example, it's probably going to take you 16 months, right, before you get this thing approved and you're ready to start raising capital. Um, when you get the first one completed, right? you have success with it. How long does it take you to, to create another A plus fund? Sure. Um, so the good thing about uh, getting everything set up to start with and building out all the systems and processes to start with is that you have a framework to essentially duplicate. So the largest part about uh, getting everything set up is making the offering circular to start off with that multi hundred page document. And once that's set up, you can essentially duplicate that over and over again. And you make, uh, for example, uh, reggae plus fund one and then two and then three, and you just kind of keep going there. And the, and the, the documentation is not really going to change. They're still going to have the same, um, you know, overall purpose. They're still going to have the same uh, returns. They're still going to have the same amount of shares, um, so on and so forth. You're really just changing the name. So the process is pretty, is a lot more streamlined once you have the first one down. Um, so, you know, I would say really just depends on how quickly we can deploy that capital and how quickly we can raise that capital in the first place. But a, a matter of months, you should be able to turn around and get a new one up and going again. Okay, great, man. Well, hey, bud, we're at the end of our show, and I want to thank you for being on. You've been a great guest. This has been a really neat conversation just around you being able to travel the world, right, and be able to make investments remotely while traveling and working a full-time W-2 job, and now talking through, you know, an A-plus fundraise, which uh, I think is great. I, I find that, you know, really fascinating, and uh, can't wait, man, to see you hit your first $20 million and deploy that, and then grow beyond that. So for that, I want to thank you for being on. You've been great. Um, now, before I ask our guests how do they get a hold of you, what is the one question that you have for me that you think may add some value to this audience? Oh, question for you. Hmm. Interesting. How do you go about actually starting a family office from being a commercial broker? Or, uh, yeah, commercial banker, sorry. Um, it's, it, it's a business just like any other business. Uh, I think the only difference is that, um, <clears throat> you know, very similar to what you've done, right? We've just built, we've just been really intentional with building out process and systems so that we can scale without having a lot of partners. But when we do bring in partners, they're on bigger opportunities and that gives us, you know, the opportunity to scale, right? So it just gives us more flexibility through which how we deploy capital. But, you know, the summary really is that, um, you know, very similar to what you have done, uh, we have traded up properties, right? I mean, I think one of the big drivers behind what we do is being able to trade up real estate or doing a 1031 exchange. That's been a really big driver for us. And then the ability to be able to leverage debt and also create multiple income streams using, um, you know, using debt or placing our own money out there in the marketplace um, that's created a lot of leverage but very very similar to what you described and the main driver for that with us you know has been to build out uh, an estate by which we can also then pass on a legacy to our kids and then you know be able to help more people right because the more you know the more you are able to build uh, the more you can actually get out there and, and really make an impact. Uh, and so that's, that's been really the driver, but 
if I have to point to one or two things that has accelerated the expansion of assets has been, you know, trading up real estate for sure. Leveraging, leveraging man, uh, the 1031 exchange opportunities that we have, you know, uh, in this, in this market. So that's been a, a really big one. And then just being really smart about how you leverage debt. Uh, you know, when I tell people that, you know, probably for the first 10 years, uh, never pulled any cash out of our properties, mm-hmm. super low leverage, right? Like our portfolio, maybe 20% leverage. Wow. And, but it gave us a lot of leverage, a lot of currency to be able to do bigger things uh, as a result of that. Right. And so now what we do is we just manage this like a business, but we're deploying capital now into other projects, other opportunities, whether they be uh, loan opportunities, right? Lending out capital, deploying capital into real estate deals. Uh, but very similar to what you described with the accounting side of things, just having really good systems to be able to do that and manage that, uh, really, really important. And it's taken a little bit of time uh, to be able to do that. But um, you know, once you have that system in place, now you can duplicate it really, really easily. So a little bit of learning experience there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like it. It's just, it's not something that you typically, you typically uh, necessarily run into family offices. I mean, that family, when I think of family office, I think of like a bill, multi-billion dollar organization. And it's like this hedge fund guy who's running it. And, you know, I don't typically think about, you know, just guys, you know, regular guys and families just putting their, you know, their assets together and, and uh, you know, lending out capital like that. So I'm just, I was just really curious about it. So thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hey, bud, I really appreciate you being on. Uh, you've been great. How do people get in touch with you, Anthony? What is the best way for them to find you online? Sure. Um, you can find me on Facebook, Anthony Pinto, um, on LinkedIn, um, on Instagram as well, although I don't really use Instagram anymore. Um, if you want to know more about our company, uh, Mission First Capital, you can check it out, uh, missionfirstcapital.co. Um, you can find all about the fund options we have there and uh, why I think it's an amazing option for military veterans and, and active duty guys uh, to be able to make their money work for them. And then if you want to email me, you can email me at, at anthony at missionfirstcapital.co, uh, CO there at the end, and happy to talk more about uh, active duty investing, especially overseas, um, really just investing as a whole in multifamily and then, and obviously the fund itself. So awesome. Man. Can reach out to me. Awesome. Yeah. Well, Hey buddy, really appreciate you being on. You've been a tremendous guest. I want to wish you continued success and um, I can't wait for you to uh, get your a plus fund approved. We got to celebrate. Absolutely, man. Yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah. I'll let you know. Sure. Sounds great, man. I appreciate you and I want to wish you a continued success, man. Appreciate you as well. Thank you, bud. Clarity of Purpose creates our greatest competitive advantage. When we transform apartment buildings to thriving communities, we improve how people live and create assets with high profit margins. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and share this up with a friend. I'm John Brackett, bringing you things you can implement right away.